sun is one of them. The sun hits on what's called the, the mm, plasma sphere or magnetic field of the Earth, the magnetosphere. Every planet except uh, Venus has one. Dr. Tesla over here in 1935 oh, or so patented a flat plate with an antenna pole underneath it going down to a couple of little things to a battery and a little motor to capture direct energy from the sun and turn it into electricity. Now his device did work, but it took you know several hours to charge up a battery and it wasn't really efficient to run your home with. So after that, there was a young fellow um, following Tesla and his work. Uh, let me just go back on that one here. Oh, don't do that to me. Okay. All right. Um, uh, here we go. Tesla, um, okay, as I said, developed that thing in 1935 and patented sometime around then. Patented, whatever. And in the steps came a guy named T. Henry Murray, who was a doctor in his own right, but a doctor of something else not related to free energy. But he knew that Tesla's work had merit. And so as a 19-year-old at the turn of the century, He'd been following Tesla. He started playing with um, antennas, insulated wires on the farm where he lived. He was a Mormon fella, uh, kid. And he found out that he could get little arcs off of this antenna that was insulated from the rest of the house uh, through a little coil in his speaker, and it was novel. Years passed, he remembered it. And eventually, through time and circumstance, he spent some time in Sweden, a guest of some of his relatives there. And there was a train car came by with um, ore. And some of the ore would drop off uh, when they'd stop at the uh, signal there at the tracks. And so as a kid, he would, a young man now, he would pick it up and take it home and collect it. He kept it with him when he went back to the States, went back home. And when he started playing with his um, uh, peculiar electric uh, discharge, his antenna, whatever, he used some of this Swedish stone, he called it. And it was a semiconductive type material, which we've now dubbed the triboluminescent material, which is just a strange term for saying it'll turn certain frequencies of light or heat into electricity directly. And he managed to build a device with um, about an 80 foot, uh, 85 foot long antenna insulated behind his house on two poles and a little wire coming off of it insulated again down to two boxes about the size of this trolley here in his home. He could extract from uh, the ambient medium, the air, he could extract about five to uh, 7,000 watts of power continuously, run his home, uh, run a heater, and do it to witnesses, let them take his boxes apart, all except one little cigar box thing about that big, which held the, the magic um, device which made it all work. And basically all he had in his box was a tuned Tesla coil system, a high voltage coil, a step down coil, and a couple of little feedback coils, and a radio circuit, a heterodyning circuit. No one would help him. In the uh, early 70s, he finally died, and his last words to his family were, why didn't they help me? In fact, they tried to assassinate him. Somebody shot at him through his, uh, his home window one time. There are so many documented cases on record of this man with sheriffs, judges, everybody reputable. And, and as I say, he was part of the Mormon community, and he was reputable. Showing him, proving that this worked, help me, he says, and we can develop you know, free energy for the world. And then it died with him. Now, his son, John, I talked to him. John didn't pay much attention to it. He was too young at the time and doesn't remember how Dad did it. Just remembers conversations and something about germanium cells and this and that. That's not the issue. The issue is where was he getting the energy from? We'll use modern technology and get it. Well, this did happen in the mid-50s, as I said. The sun throws out particles at around um, 400 to 1,200 kilometers per second, pretty fast million or two million miles an hour or something like that. I forget what the exact figure is, but it's, it's huge. And that hits us all the time, sprayed off from the sun. We get hit all the time from particles that are called uh, baryons and leptons, high-speed cosmic energy from other galaxies and other star systems, all the time hitting us. They're hitting everything, but we're getting our fair share of it because we're in the neighborhood. All these things strike a magnetic bubble around the Earth. As I said, every planet and some of the moons of, of Jupiter has a bubble like this, except for, for Venus, and it might have one once it settles down and spins the right direction. This guy here, Moray, tapped into a way to sit on the ground here with some insulated wires 
and reach out uh, electronically, if you wish, and feel the pressure of that solar wind as it vibrated at sometimes 30 million times of a second when a particle hit have an impulse of a 30 millionth of a second, bang, like that. So much energy in it that some of those particles go straight on through the earth. They're huge. And he said, you know, I noticed that my energy drops off from this coil about 20% at nighttime, but it still runs at night. Well, no direct sunlight. It's because of this magnetopause that we will look at here. This, uh, the little brown thing in the middle there next to those dark blue circles, right here, that's Earth. And this is the field, the magnetic field of the Earth as it moves through that solar wind. It gets bent around like a coma around a, a, a comet. And if you can imagine this being like a, a charged balloon full of charged air, and there's things beating on it like that all the time. At any one point in time, say in a 30 millionth of a second, roughly speaking, there's going to be a number of particles that are hitting, and there's going to be a number of rebounds from just being hit. And the net of those two is some energy for you. So if you can rake off that, that energy for that fraction of a second, then you've got that energy trapped down in your little device, and the system doesn't know anything about it. It fills the hole with some more energy from more par uh, particles from the sun. Now, where we went a while ago is, is uh, where we belong now. This is the, the Van Allen belts, the radiation belts around the Earth, the outer one and the inner one. As particles hit it, oh, yeah. As particles hit it, it rebounds like this. And it presses on the, the red one down there, which then presses on the surface of the Earth. What we do is build a charged pocket of air on the surface of the Earth with these wires. And when they get pushed on, they're going to make voltage. And how do we know this? Professor John Trump um, at uh, MIT, he's now de deceased as well, I wrote about him in my book, made a most remarkable discovery uh, in the 50s again with high voltage. Two plates there. Those two plates represent 10 inches by 10 inches metal plates. They're in a very high vacuum. And he has the ability to measure the attractive force between these plates when he puts a charge on it. So he said to me, and I went to see John before he died, he said, I put 300 volts per centimeter, that's a term for the, 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 the field intensity, I put 300 volts per centimeter between his plates and I measured the force at five ten thousandths of a pound. Bugger all, not much at anyway. So then he says, I raised it to 30,000 volts per centimeter, only, only raised it a hundred times, but yet the force is now up to half a pound, a thousand times more. So he said, well, I wonder what happened if we could go to the limit of our equipment to 3 million volts per centimeter. Watch this. Five and a half, well, 5.7 thousand pounds of force between two plates, 100 square inches each. Now, the outer atmosphere, that green envelope you just saw and the red one, those are our plates. And we've got the Earth is, is part of it, the whole system. There's three plates involved.